Hello from the National Archives Public Programs and Education staff. My name is Sarah Lyons Davis. I'm an education specialist at the National Archives. Welcome to the National Archives Comes Alive Young Learners Program. Today, we meet Mark Twain. Samuel Langhorn Clemens, also known by his pen name, Mark Twain, was an American writer and humorist. Twain is considered one of America's greatest writers, producing classic novels such as The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Thank you for joining us today to learn about how he got his start writing and the many friendships he made during his long career. Mark Twain is portrayed by Bob Gleason of the American Historical Theater. The National Archives has many records related to Mark Twain, including this photograph. This photograph is dated between the years of 1862 and 1884 and can be found in the Frank W. Legg Photographic Collection of 19th Century Notables, including literary, political, religious, and military personalities, as well as musicians, theatrical artists, and educators. Mark Twain's photograph is found among other notables, such as Frederick Douglass, President Rutherford B. Hayes, Henry Ward Beecher, and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Here we have a photograph of the home of Mark Twain from 1874 when it was completed. The house is located in Hartford, Connecticut and remained his property until 1903. It was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1963. This photograph is part of a series of images of the house taken when it was nominated to the National Register of Historic Places. In his book, Mr. Clemens and Mark Twain, author Justin Kaplan described the structure as, the house was permanent polychrome and gingerbread Gothic. It was part steamboat, part medieval stronghold and part cuckoo clock. It was the conspicuous symbol of his success as a writer, lecturer and dramatist. If you look closely at the photo, you can see what Clemens wanted a radical departure from the typical box-like Hartford houses of the period. And Edward Tuckerman Potter, an architect active in the Hartford area, designed for him this asymmetrical polychromatic brick structure with sweeping cornices and gables and flamboyant patterns of black and vermilion brick. Because of the well-known characters, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, Clemens is most readily identified with Hannibal and the Midwest. Ironically, he did not write in Missouri. It was during the 17 years he lived in this house he commissioned at 351 Farmington Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut, that numerous books, sketches, and articles were written. These included The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The Prince and the Pauper, Life on the Mississippi, A Tramp Abroad, and a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. Samuel Clemens first came to Hartford in 1868 to discuss the publishing of Innocence Abroad with Alicia Bliss, president of the American Publishing Company. Clemens liked Hartford from the time of that visit and shortly afterward wrote, of all the beautiful towns, it has been my fortune to see, this is the chief. In 1870, he married Olivia Langdon of Elmira, New York, and in 1871, he left his job on the Buffalo, New York Express and moved to Hartford, attracted by its location, industry, and list of literary and social personalities. Because his publisher, Bliss, and many literary friends lived there, the Clemenses decided in 1873 to make Hartford their permanent residence. With the proceeds from the publication of Innocence Abroad, they bought land and commissioned Edward Tuckerman Potter to design their house. The Clemens chose for their home the Nook Farm area, a small, closely knit, influential community where the neighbors, among them Harriet Beecher Stowe and Charles Dudley Warner, and their many guests met for dinner parties and tea, charades, and weekly stag billiard sessions. The elderly Mrs. Stowe often wandered into the Clemens home to play their piano. She designed their conservatory with its dripping fountain, 
similar to one she designed for other Nook farmhouses. The house was completed in September 1874, and Mr. and Mrs. Clemens and daughters, Susie, born in 1872, and Clara, born in 1874, moved in. The third daughter, Jean, was born in 1880. The house represents Samuel L. Clemens, successful author and family man. This house saw his rise to the peak of his creative powers and his tragic financial failure. If you're in the Hartford, Connecticut area, you can still visit the home today. Today's program is brought to you from the National Archives Public Programs and Education Team and the National Archives Foundation. You can find information for free teacher and student programs on the National Archives website, archives.gov, under Archives News, Upcoming Events, and if you follow the National Archives on social media. So now, let us meet Mark Twain. Good morning. My name is not Mark Twain. My name is Samuel Langhorn Clemens, and uh, I really shouldn't be here at all. I should be a farmer in West Virginia, but things kept happening, you see. The first thing that happened was that my grandfather, whom I am named after, uh, was killed in an accident while trying to build a new house. Uh, the rest of his family decided that the place was unlucky, so they all moved to Kentucky, except me, because I hadn't been born yet. Uh, my father, in, once in Kentucky, had to get a job to help support the family, so he wound up being a clerk for an iron mine. He was 11 years old at the time. I suppose being a clerk, you only need to be able to read and write, and so he did. Now, in Kentucky, he met my mother. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been born at all. And uh, so they were married, and uh, my father decided that uh, by that time, of course, he had grown up there in Kentucky and had become a lawyer and sometimes a judge and operated a general store, which is a little store full of stuff people might need. Anyhow, he, he decided that he'd try to find some greener pastures to be rich in, and they moved to Tennessee, where he began to buy land, uh, land with lots of trees on it, figuring that people needed wood to build their houses and the fences and who knows what all else. Uh, the problem was, although he owned a lot of land, people didn't seem to want the trees. Uh, this country apparently had more trees than anybody needed. In, in fact, a squirrel could go from the Delaware River to the Ohio River without touching the ground through all the trees. Well, uh, I wasn't born in Tennessee either because my father decided to move someplace where he could make a bigger mark on the map. So we moved to Florida, and there, finally, I was born. Now, now that wasn't the famous... Florida that you've heard of, the state, the, the one with all the alligators. It was a, a sleepy little town in Missouri, Florida, Missouri. And there was about 100 people in it. And I uh, increased the population by 1% just by being born there. Uh, my father realized that the town was too small for him to make a decent living in. So we packed everything up and moved again, this time to Hannibal, Missouri a place that was named after a, a famous ancient general who tried to conquer Rome with a herd of elephants. And uh, so his name was Hannibal and the name of the town was Hannibal, but I don't recall seeing any elephants in any time. So there I, uh, well, we, we, um, we lived at the time, we lived in the Mark Twain house, which would seem like an awful big coincidence, except it wasn't called the Mark Twain house then. Uh, it was just our house. And there I went to school and uh, played with the local children, which uh, uh, everybody uh, at our age did. We played in the woods, we'd be pirates along the river, we'd make up games, we'd have our circuses, just what uh, kids do uh, when left to their own devices. Uh, unfortunately for me, and uh, more unfortunately for my father, he, he died of pneumonia when I was only 11 years old. So I had to find a job just like he did back in Kentucky. So I was apprenticed, which means I, I went to work for a, a printer to learn the printing business, uh, setting the type and printing the pamphlets and the books and the newspapers. You had to be able to read upside down and backwards to be a good printer. So I learned that trade. And finally, I was uh, 
good enough at it to go out on my own as a what they call a, a journeyman printer. So I journeyed. I journeyed to St. Louis and got a job there working for a newspaper. Then I journeyed to New York and worked there on a newspaper. Then I journeyed to Philadelphia and worked on the newspaper there. And after a while, I, I got uh, not homesick. I missed my family. So I came back to Hannibal, but I, I didn't want to be a printer anymore. I'd had a dream since I was a child. In fact, all of us boys did back in Hannibal that one day we'd grow up and work on the big steamboats on the river. And most importantly of all, to get a job as a pilot on the steamboat. Now the pilot is a fella who uh, steers the boat and makes sure it doesn't run into anything. He has to know the river by heart, coming and going in daylight and in darkness. And he's the only entirely independent fellow on the face of the earth. Nobody can tell the pilot what to do. So uh, I, I applied to a particular pilot named Bixby uh, to be a student, you know, his apprentice, a trainee, I guess you'd call it. And uh, he agreed to teach me the river for the sum of $500 to be taken from my salary once I got my license as a pilot, I would pay him back. So for two whole years, I was a student of Mr. Bixby and learning the river, 1,200 miles of it, coming and going, every snag, every stone, every ripple, every eddy, every sandbar that could possibly get in our way, and writing it all down in a little book so I'd remember everything. It was uh, an interesting job, really, the pilot's way up on top of the boat where he can see everything. And uh, most importantly for the boat and the pilot's career, there was another fella on the front of the boat with a rope with a weight on it, throwing the rope into the river, letting it go down and measuring how deep the water was at any given time. And he'd call out uh, the, the measurements on the rope. And the most eagerly anticipated measurement was this one. By the Mark Twain, which meant there were two fathoms of water or 12 feet of water under the boat, safe passage for any boat on the river. It was a joyful noise for us pilots to hear. Well, after two years of training, I got my license as a pilot and began to get work on different boats coming and going. And I had a pretty good reputation as a pilot. I was careful, I was dependable, I was polite, and I was prepared to spend the rest of my life on the river steering the boats until they had to carry me off uh, uh, to the graveyard. And I was prepared for that. But what I wasn't prepared for was the Civil War. The Civil War broke out right in the middle of my pilot's career. And when it did, traffic on the Mississippi River just stopped overnight. One day, we were hauling more cargo than any other waterway in the world. And the next day, you could hear a pin drop. I was out of a job. What was I supposed to do? Well, I didn't want to go back to the printing business. I'd had enough of that. And I found out that my brother, Orion, uh, well, he had been working for the campaign of Mr. Abraham Lincoln, the president. And Mr. Lincoln got to be president. And, and in gratitude, he offered my brother, Orion, the job of secretary to the governor of the new Nevada Territory. And he would accompany the uh, governor out to Nevada and write down whatever the governor said, I suppose, as the secretary is supposed to do. Well, I, I applied to Orion to go with him. I said, well, I'll pay for our, our uh, journey out there if you'll take me as the secretary to the secretary of the governor of the Nevada Territory. And he agreed to take me along. So as, uh, as Mr. Horace Greeley said, go west, young man. And so we went west on top of the stagecoach which was the most comfortable place to ride uh, in good weather, of course. And we saw the, the magnificent vistas and beauties of this country riding along on top of the stagecoach, eating hard boiled eggs and ham. And uh, that we thought was the most wonderful way to travel that had ever been invented. Of course, 10 years later, people were traveling by railroad, eating antelope steaks, drinking champagne. And instead of the two weeks it took us, to get to Nevada, it took them only two hours. So, well, that's progress, and I'm getting away from my story. We get to Nevada, my brother goes to work as secretary, and I try to go to work and find out that there really was nothing to do 
for the secretary to the secretary of the governor of Nevada. I had no duties. I got bored and decided, well, the other thing they do here in Nevada is mine for silver and gold. I suppose I can give that a try. So I went out to the silver fields and the gold fields. I'd heard what you could just pick the gold and silver up off the ground and get rich overnight. But I was misinformed. Apparently, you had to dig for the gold and silver with a long-handled shovel, and I never had any use for long-handled shovels. So I, I looked around and thought, well, they got a newspaper here. I guess I can get back into that business, and I applied to work on the newspaper, and they asked me if I was any good at writing. I said, well, I can, I've written a few things for my brother's newspaper. I suppose I can write for yours. So they said, well, you'll be our wandering reporter gather the news, and write the articles, and put them in our paper. So I did. I was a reporter gathering the news when there was any news to gather and making it up if there weren't any. And uh, continued to go west from newspaper to newspaper until I found myself in San Francisco uh, working on the newspapers there. And there I was a crusading reporter uncovering corruption in politics and general government and uh, all kinds of businesses made a name for myself as a crusading reporter, and that name was Mud. Uh, I was fired for making too many people too angry, uh, having my editor constantly being challenged to duels by offended customers. Uh, I didn't know what to do then. I, I wasn't going to go back to the silver mines. I thought, well, um, I'll take some time to think it over. And I went up to a place called Angel's Camp up in the hills where I had some friends from my mining days. And uh, I stayed with them for the winter. While I was there, I heard a fella tell a story about a marvelous jumping frog, a champion jumping frog, who, uh, uh, well, he uh, was the most jumpingest frog they ever saw out there and was constantly winning contests. And, well, this happened and that happened. And I, I took the story and I cleaned it up a bit and polished it and sent it back east to some friends I had there. And one of them managed to get it published in a famous periodical. And once it was published in that magazine, it got published in all kinds of magazines, practically all over the world. I became famous overnight. And by that time, I had been signing my newspaper articles as Mark Twain. I, I felt that Samuel Langhorne Clements didn't have enough spark to it. So I, I took that uh, slogan from the riverboat, which meant two fathoms of safe water, as I've said before, and uh, used it as my, as they call it, my nom de plume, my pen name. So Mark Twain was the author of the celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County. And it was Mark Twain who was hired by a San Francisco newspaper to be their special correspondent to the Sandwich Islands. Now, you maybe have never heard of the Sandwich Islands, but their true name is Hawaii. They were discovered, so to speak, by a, uh, a Captain Cook, and he named it after a friend of his back in England, whose name happened to be the Earl of Sandwich. And, uh, well, I don't know why exactly, but uh, Sandwich it was. So there I was, on the Sandwich Islands in Hawaii, gathering information and writing articles about the beauty of the land and the splendor of the geography and the, the gentle natives who've been living there for centuries. And the articles I sent back were very popular in the newspapers in California and uh, across the country. And I thought, well, I, this is a lovely place, this Hawaii. I, I suppose I could settle down here and live here for the rest of my life. And soon everybody would forget about Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens, and nobody would ever hear me again. But I, I became homesick. I, I missed my friends in San Francisco. I missed my family. So I got back on a boat and went back to California. But I, I still needed a way to make a living. And a friend of mine suggested that since my letters about uh, the life in Hawaii were so popular, I should hire a hall, sell tickets, and give a lecture about it. And I thought, well, I've never done that. Uh, I guess it can't hurt. So I hired a hall and I sold tickets. And uh, we had a full house and I gave my lecture about my adventures in Hawaii. And it was a great success. And I started traveling from, from town to town and city to city. I even went to mining camps and gave my stories about Hawaii there. And uh, then uh, I thought, well, now I'll see how this plays back east. I'll go visit my family and, and uh, see if I can get some lectures up in New York and Philadelphia, and so I did. 
and uh, that uh, I became famous as Mark Twain, the lecturer and adventurer. And thought, well, all right, now these are just uh, lectures and letters. Let me see if I can do something a little more substantial. I was sent by some publishers to uh, travel on a boat called the Quaker City with a bunch of people who wanted to see the Mediterranean and uh, the Middle East and all the European countries. And I was to report on their adventures. And so I did. And I wrote a book about it called Innocence Abroad. And then I wrote another book of my adventures called Roughing It, on my, how I got out to California. And uh, another book called uh, A Tramp Abroad. And finally, I, I began to write books about not just my adventures, but books about things that never happened at all. Uh, the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, which involved time travel, and uh, The Prince and the Pauper, about twins in the time of King Henry VIII. And uh, that's how I became the famous author, Mark Twain. But my friends still call me Sam. Thank you so much for that interesting information about your journey with how you got here. Do you have a few moments for us to ask some questions? Oh, I'd be delighted. Questions cheerfully answered, mostly true. Wonderful, thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about your family, maybe your marriage and children? Well, now my marriage was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, on that boat, Quaker City, uh, on our travels abroad, I met a young man named Charles Langdon. And he showed me a picture of his sister, Olivia. And I was so taken, so struck by her beauty. And uh, what I could see of her in the picture, she must have been a gentle and kind creature. And I made up my mind that I was going to marry that young lady the first chance I got. So when I got back to the United States, I went to visit Charles, uh, uh, which was my pretext for getting to meet Olivia. And I courted her for two years until I finally won her over and won over her father. And we were married. So uh, that's how I came to be a married man. She civilized me and I, uh, well, I amused her. Uh, kept her uh, laughing, which is about the best thing you can do to have a happy marriage is keep them laughing. Now, we had children, of course. Uh, uh, we had three girls and a little boy, uh, uh, Susie, Clara, Jean, and uh, young Langdon. Uh, does that, uh, that cover it? Thank you. Yes. And... Um... So you lived with them in Connecticut, and we saw a photo of that house in Connecticut. Well, first we lived in, in uh, uh, Buffalo, New York. My uh, mm. father-in-law was quite a wealthy man, and he arranged for me to own a newspaper up there. But uh, it was very cold, and we decided we wanted a uh, more uh, salubrious climate, so we moved to Hartford, Connecticut, Mostly because as a as an up and coming young writer, I wanted to be where the writers were, and they all seemed to be around there. And we built uh, a fabulous house that people said looked like a steamboat, but I didn't think it looked exactly like a steamboat. But it was the kind of house I wanted to live in, and so it was done, and so we enjoyed it. And didn't you also live in Europe for a time? Well, the common time. Uh, they say that each man has within himself the seeds of his own destruction. I made a lot of money with my books and my publishing business. And even with one of my inventions, I invented a self-pasting scrapbook that you knew your pictures in. And I decided, well, I want to be even more successful and I'm going to invest in something that's going to make a lot of money. A new invention. It was a printing press. And I had some experience with printing presses. And this printing press was so complicated, nobody could really get the thing to work properly for any long distance of time. And I kept putting money into it until we were nearly bankrupt. And uh, it, it was uh, considered uh, a disgrace for a fellow in my position to declare bankruptcy and, and run out on his debts. So we decided to move to Europe for a while where it was cheaper to live. And uh, Olivia liked the idea of seeing the fine old houses of Italy and France and Germany. So we traveled and we, we uh, saw things and did things and were very happy uh, to, to live there. But eventually we, we did come back. Thank you. And what is your favorite book that you wrote? Oh, well, now, you know, that's a, 
That's a tricky question. It's like asking who your favorite child is. But I did have a favorite book that uh, was part of my thinking process for years. When I was a little boy, walking down the street, I found some papers. And on those papers was the story of Joan of Arc, the famous young French girl who commands the French army and defeats the British uh, and puts the king back on the throne. Uh, and she was only 17. She was the youngest general uh, ever and uh, one of the few at the time, the only uh, young lady running an army. I thought, this is a fantastic story, and I'm going to write about it someday. So eventually, when I had the time and the opportunity, I wrote a book about Joan of Arc. And uh, since it had been with me for so long, I, I consider it my favorite book of all the books I've written. The story of that magnificent young lady, Joan of Arc. Mm, what a wonderful story. Thank you. And I know you're known for wearing a white suit. Mm. Is there a reason you always wear a white suit? Well, I don't always wear the white suit, but I, I wear it on special occasions. The first, uh, in my time, uh, in the summertime, you wore lighter, cooler clothing so that you didn't roast to death. So white was the uh, color of choice for people trying to keep the sun's rays off of them. And uh, I thought, well, uh, I'm going to wear this suit on special occasions. And one of those occasions, the one that really grabbed the attention of the public, was a meeting that was held in Washington, D.C. by authors and Congress about the problems with copyright. That means that you write something and it's yours and people can't just go publishing it somewhere and not pay you for it, which was going on all the time. The English were stealing our books and we were stealing their books. So we, we wanted to find some legal method to guarantee our copyrights. Well, I went down there with a big black overcoat over with my white suit and went into the meeting, and uh, when the important government people came in and sat down, I took off my black coat, and there I was in my white suit, like a, like a lighthouse, a beacon in the middle of all those dark winter clothes. It was February, mind you, so uh, folks weren't wearing white suits in February. Well, that got the attention of the reporters, and was published in the papers, and gave us a lot of publicity for our efforts uh, on behalf of copyright. And then after that, people expected me to be wearing that white suit wherever I went. So I have a whole closet full of them, uh, but uh, they're not very warm in the wintertime. Well, thank you. And I do have one final question for the day. What advice do you have for young people today? Oh my, what advice? Uh, uh, I've gotten lots of advice in my time. Some of it was good advice and some of it was not so good. I, I think, my best advice would be that whatever it is you're fixing to do, planning to do, or dream to do, uh, make sure you're right, and then go ahead. Well, thank you so much for sharing that advice and all of the wonderful stories and information um, that you shared with us today. We really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. Well, I'm grateful for your interest, and uh, thank you for your time. And now one last look at Mark Twain's house in Hartford, Connecticut. I hope you can join next month for our Young Learners program with Nellie Bly, American journalist who made a name for herself by going undercover to expose and report on the realities of working situations and corruption. One of her most well-known stories is of the adventures she took comparing the realities of going around the world in 80 days, according to a popular novel of the day. Thank you for participating in our program today.